I'm Larry Schrader. I'm the mayor of Claremont. I hope that uh, people have at least heard of the topic of new police station or the revised police station. And we want to give you some details. Uh, if you're not convinced we need a new station, you might want to take a tour one of these days and see where everybody's working, how close the quarters are, and how outdated the station is. And I think the chief's going to give you a little background on that. And tonight we're going to not only talk a little bit about that, uh, but the design, uh, the new design, and then the financing mechanisms. So again, thank you for coming tonight. And with that, I'll give it to our city manager, Tony Ramos. That's better. Is that better? Good evening, everyone. Well, it's nice to see a few more people out this evening than we've had over the past couple of presentations. As the mayor said, I'm Tony Ramos. I'm the city manager. I'm going to give you a little bit of background on how we got here this evening. The police facility is something that the city has been working on for the past 15 years, exploring various different options for the facility due to the age and condition of the existing facility. The current station was built in 1972 for a police department with all male officers and half the size of our current police force. The station no longer meets federal um, and state guideline building standards. It does not meet Essential Service Building Seismic Safety Act of 1986. The public safety facility must be built one and a half times stronger than commercial residential buildings. Our jail is currently at risk for decertification by the California Correction Standards Authority as a jail and the existing mechanical and electrical systems have become obsolete, are no longer adequate for supporting the technology and communication systems required to run a modern day police facility. The council's been working on this, talking about this. They've had several committees look at this. I think we've gotten to a place and the chief is gonna go into a little more detail on the exacts of the um, facility itself. We're at a point now where the city council needs to make a decision. Um, I'll talk a little bit more about that and where we go from here after um, we're done with the next couple of presentations. I'm gonna ask our chief to come up and give the report of the police ad hoc committee and their findings so she can explain to you how we actually got to where we are at this present moment on what we're presenting to you this evening. So, Shelly, would you like to come up please? So following the, the failure of Measure PS, then Mayor Kaleke formed a 15-person ad hoc committee to review the proposed facility and provide new recommendations on the facility design, location, cost, and funding. The goal provided to staff during the ad hoc meetings was 25, 25, 25. 25,000 square feet at 25 million with a 25-year financing term. The city hired an architect with experience building public safety buildings to draft a design for the facility based on the ad hoc committee's criteria. The committee met for over six months and presented their recommendations to the city council in July 2017. The design I'll be showing you today was presented to the ad hoc committee and after a complete review of the entire project, they had the following recommendations to city council. The size of 26,000 square feet, a cost of 25 million, the location to remain at our current site on Bonita Avenue with a bond term of 25 years and a financing mechanism of a general obligation bond. Although the financing mechanism recommended to council was a geo bond, the direction was not unanimous amongst the ad hoc committee. Following the presentation of the ad hoc recommendations, the City Council directed staff to gather feedback from the community on the proposed facility, especially the financing mechanism, in anticipation of placing it on a June 2018 ballot. With the re recommendation of City Council, we planned four community me meetings in 2017, two of which were completed at the police station, which included a tour of our current facility, this one here today, and we'll have a second one on October 19th at the Blaisdell Center. Now I'll go over the design of the new police facility. What you see here is the overall site plan. 
the ad hoc committee's recommendation was to build the new facility at our current site at 570 West Benita. To make that happen, the plan would be to build the new facility to the west of the current station, allowing the department to continue to use the existing building during the construction. Once the construction is completed, the existing building would be removed and that area would be the parking lot that you see on the right of that screen. As you look at this plan, Benita is across the top and the fire station 101 is off to the left. The overall plan includes public parking lot with 11 spaces. Our current facility has a four parking spaces, a secure police department parking for the police and its employees. We currently do not have secure parking. And our current impound uh, lot that is 78 spaces would be reduced to 25 spaces. And that allows us to build on our current site. Uh, currently our impound lot uh, covers the whole south end of the property. With the new build, it would be just in the lower left-hand corner to that, that property to the rear of the fi fire station. And as designed, the proposed facility has a square footage of approximately 26,000 square feet. And this design is a 45% reduction in size from the plan that was rejected by the voters in 2015. In order to fit at that location, the building would have to be two-story. Here you see the ground floor. Just to point out a few highlights, there will be an elevator and two staircases, a multi-purpose room seating up to 50 people, and this space would be used for CERT meetings and trainings and community meetings such as neighborhood and business watch meetings. There's a male and female locker room with a 900 square foot exercise room. And I'll point out our current station, when it was designed, anticipated there to be zero female officers during the life of the building. And that's why our female officers now have a locker room and a portable trailer. So the new facility would have a locker room for the females inside the facility. Also, space-saving rolling filing system would be used in, in the records bureau as well as evidence room to maximize use of space. And what you see on the lower left is the jail facility. The jail facility would have a male and female division with three female cells and four male cells. There's also a male and female sober cell and secure juvenile cell, cell to meet state requirements. There's also a secure interview room within the jail facility to be used by officers and detectives and an inmate visiting room. Currently, our interview room is outside of the secure jail facility. So when the detectives want to interview somebody in custody, they have to walk them into the non-secure area of the police department where they interview them and then return them back, back to the jail. So it, it, this is a very important part of our proposed jail facility. I also want to point out that LA County jails at municipal cities are type one jails. That means we hold the people in custody up to 96 hours and we bring them to court on their first court date. This differs from San Bernardino County agencies where they book them within their facility and then they bring them to West Valley where they hold them. So that's why we, there's a need for a jail facility at our building. And here's the, the second floor. The second floor encompasses mainly administrative offices, the detective bureau, conference rooms for staff or board meetings, the IT room, and also a, a break room. And here's what your station would look like from the street view on Bonita Avenue. And here's an aerial from the northwest corner. And you see the lower right, that is a patio area that would be used by the multi-purpose room. Here's westbound from Cornell. As you can see, the budget includes covered parking with solar and also room to house our mobile EOC, which you'll see in the, the center of the screen. There. Here's the street level view from the northeast corner. And the entrance plaza looking east. The street view from Berkeley. And where that individual is walking out of the building, that's, he's exiting the jail facility. Currently, when we have somebody exit our jail facility, we walk them through the station and then out uh, the front, through the lobby, out the front door, in lieu of just releasing them out into our back parking lot. So this is another feature that's imperative for a safe jail facility. 
And here's a street level view from the southwest corner and you can see the, the secured parking area. And now I'll go over the updated uh, project costs. The total cost for the building is 15 and a half million, which is 12 million for building costs and three and a half for site development. With any build, there's additional costs. There's 1.5 for total for architect and engineering fees, 1.4 for technical construction consulting, 1 million for construction management, and 40,000 for signage. And just note that this is not, it does not include any art or monuments to the front. It's just the necessary signage for a building. Handicap parking, for example, the exit signs, the Claremont Police Department to the front. It does not include any extras. Environmental review of 100,000. Site services with poor utilities, 75,000. Moving or relocation costs, 10,000. Fixtures, furniture, and equipment, which will be referred to as FF&E, 1.5 million. Radio and communication equipment at 725,000. Now we currently don't have an exact cost on our radio equipment. The 725,000 would just cover a portion of the radio replacement cost. There's also 1.6 for cost escalation two years at 5% per year. And this cost escalation would cover the time period through the bidding process if the ballot measure were to go in June of 2018. And there's also a contingency of approximately one and a half million. So the total estimated project cost is 25 million. And this project cost remained within the total 25 million budget that was recommended by the ad hoc committee. At previous community meetings, the city has been asked how the proposed facility compares to other recently built stations. And before I go on to those comparisons, I ask that you keep in mind that it can be difficult to compare project costs since factors in each build vary. And here's some examples. The cost of land. In some cases, the city owns the property. Other cases, they don't. In some cases, there may be site work, grading, slope, curbs, gutters that need to be added, landscaping, environmental cleanup, demolition, and on our particular site, it has a, a slope of 6%. So that there's an increased cost in the grading to, to uh, accommodate for that 6% slope. And varies on number of stories. Some are single stories, some two, some three. And amenities including in the building, some include gun, gun ranges, community rooms, jail facilities, evidence storage, et cetera. And some builds have to go in phases. Claremont's construction will be phased to allow the operation to continue at the existing site. And also, demolition of our existing site is also included in our costs. And timing. Code requirements change each year. Price of materials and labor fluctuates based on market demand. And also, project costs may include other expenses, not just building construction, furnishing, computers, radios, permits, legal expenses, etc. So here are some cost comparisons of stations built within the last 10 years. You see on the chart the cost of Montclair, San Dimas, San Gabriel, Signal Hill, and Whittier stations, compared to the estimate for Claremont Station. The Turner Building Cost Index used when comparing construction costs. The cost index takes into consideration a nationwide basis of labor rates and productivity, material prices, and competitive condition of the marketplace. When looking at this chart, Note that the San Gabriel station has not been built and the cost listed is based on a 2014 bid and 2010 building codes. Montclair, San Dimas, Signal Hill, and Whittier's are known costs since the projects are complete, whereas Claremont's cost is based on an added 10% contingency. Whittier and Signal Hill use the same cost estimator office as Claremont's bid and they were both completed under budget. And now I'll turn over to our finance director, Adam. Good evening. Thank you. <clears throat> Excuse me. Good evening. Thank you all for being here. Uh, I'm going to discuss some of the uh, financing options that are available to us uh, to fund the public safety facility. Uh, but before I do that, I'd just like to talk about uh, some of the assumptions that we had to make uh, prior to coming up with some of the estimates of the cost of financing. 
Uh, the first of which uh, was our uh, estimate of $23.5 million in debt proceeds that would be required in order for us to construct a $25 million facility. This includes a million and a half dollar general fund contribution for furniture, fixtures and equipment. Um, the financing scenarios that we'll use also include financing term of 25 years as, uh, uh, as Cap Chief Van Der Veen mentioned. Uh, we're also assuming at this point that no federal grants are available for, for the construction of the project. And we're also assuming that uh, financing costs are at current uh, market rates. Um, I do want to point out that as opportunities become available, uh, staff would apply for grants and other sources of funding which could be used to reduce the amount of, of funding that we need to bond for. The, uh, the ad hoc committee considered two financing options. One was a general obligation bond and one was a parcel tax. Uh, a general obligation bond is the most common form of debt off, uh, issued by local governments. Uh, under a geo bond, uh, voters authorize the issuance of bonds and the levy of a tax based on the assessed value of property to repay the bonds. And to give you some perspective, the city of Claremont issued general obligation bonds to, pon to purchase General uh, Johnson's pasture in 2007. Uh, in contrast, a parcel tax is also uh, authorized by voters. Uh, it's a levy of a special tax which uh, the city can then use uh, to repay debt that is authorized by the city council, and that debt is repaid by the collection of an annual special tax. Uh, under a parcel tax, the rate at which the tax can be assessed uh, can vary, uh, and we used two, uh, two methods in... Um, in presenting the options to the ad hoc committee. The first was on a square footage basis, uh, based on building square footage, and the second was on a flat rate per parcel. Uh, here we've got a, a comparison of the three different financing options that, we, that the uh, committee considered. Uh, from a voter approval perspective, a two-thirds requirement is required for both a general obligation bond as well as a parcel tax. Uh, the tax basis, uh, a general obligation bond is assessed on what's called an ad valorem basis, which is a rate assessed per unit of assessed value. Uh, a parcel tax based on square footage uh, is a rate that uh, is based on the uh, square footage of improvements on a, on a particular property, and then it can also be assessed at a flat rate per parcel. Uh, some entities are exempt from the tax that would be levied under a general obligation bond namely educational institutions, churches, non-profits, uh, and the colleges, uh, while there would be no exemptions under a parcel tax. Our annual debt service costs under a general obligation bond would be approximately $1.44 million at current rates and about $1.53 million under a parcel tax scenario. Uh, the rate, or the total debt service amount, would be $36.06 million assessed over uh, 25 years for a general obligation bond and $38.33 million for a parcel tax over 25 years also. Uh, the tax rate that we would assess under each scenario is $31.08 per $100,000 in assessed value for a general obligation bond, 5.03 cents per square foot of building area under a parcel tax based on square footage, and under a flat rate per parcel uh, assessment, the amount would be $146.02 per parcel per year. This chart here just gives you some examples of, of what assessments might look like. Uh, the table on the left is a geo bond, and under that example, a $600,000 property or a property with an assessed value of $600,000 would pay an assessment of $186.48 per year. Uh, if that uh, particular parcel had a, a square footage of 2,500 square feet, the assessment would be $125.76 a year under the square footage method and under a flat rate method, the bottom table shows the assessment of $146.02 per parcel per year. Uh, and and, and by, by way of another example, um, we could compare properties that are similar in size but maybe differ in, in assessed value. Uh, if, ex if, for example, household A has an assessed value of $250,000 because it's been owned by the same property owner for several years and has a square footage of 2,000 square feet, you'd see that under a geo bond, that particular parcel would pay $77.10 per year, 
under a flat rate parcel tax, that assessment would be $146.02, and under a parcel tax based on square footage, we would pay $100.60 per year. Household B may have been a, a property that was purchased more recently at $650,000, which represents uh, something close to the current median home sale price. Uh, under that assessed value, a general obligation bond would result in an assessment of $202.02 .02 per year, while the parcel tax uh, assessments under both methods would stay the same, since the square footage of the parcel is the same. Uh, I'll now turn it back over to Tony Ramos to tell us what's, uh, what's next. Adam, thank you, Chief. So where do we go from here? What the council will do now is we are having all of these meetings. We'll compile the information that we have received from these meetings. We will then report back to the city council in December. They will then make the decision of determination whether they want to move forward, which funding mechanism they may choose, whether they don't want to move forward. Um, so that'll be important for those of you that want to have additional comments after you've sat through this, these informational meetings to go ahead and show up to that council meeting, but we'll make sure we really get the word out as to exactly when the council will be addressing it. So at this point, I would like to also remind everyone there are forms in the back to fill out if there's questions you want answered um, that you don't want to ask me directly tonight. You could also go online. The information is on there as well. If you want to see this presentation again, it's also online. So we really want to make sure we get as much of the information out to everybody as possible. Um, I would like to open it up to questions for anybody that has anything specific that they'd like to ask that wasn't covered this evening. Um, to the best of our ability, we'll go ahead and answer. A lot of the information we're adding to some of these community meetings um, of what our residents have asked for. So if you've attended one of the previous meetings, we've added a couple of slides. We'll also um, add a frequently asked questions um, information on our website so that we can keep everyone updated as much as possible. 